good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to this edition of the business and policy dialogue uh, i apologize for this delay uh, when we are talking about digital governance and service delivery there's been a bit of service delivery issues at our end so apologies on that front uh, nonetheless uh, we are here to you know sort of listen to two very interesting people who are with us one shri ravi bhagat ias secretary punjab mandi board and special secretary governance reforms government of punjab uh, in conversation with mr bhagat is professor aditya dar who is an assistant professor in the economics and public policy at the indian school of business the inefficient and poor quality of basic public service delivery is a long standing policy challenge in india in recent years governments have attempted to address these problems by greater use of computerization of government services furthering electronic procurement promoting dbts creating digital identities for citizens and transitioning to mobile or app based applications in this particular edition of the business and policy dialogue we will explore punjab's experience with digital governance reforms i now invite uh, professor aditya dar to take over uh, welcome and introduce our guest and uh, take the dialogue forward aditya over to you thank you so much uh, guru um we are extremely delighted to have uh, shri ravi uh, bhagat ji joining us today he's an um, ias uh, officer from the 2006 batch um he's an illustrious officer with an educational background and multiple degrees uh, masters in arts in regional development from the jawaharlal nehru university uh, msc in public policy and management from kings college london um and a mphil in geopolitics of integration um for again from the genu um mr uh, bhagat has had um, has a, you know is a gold medalist um he has been awarded multiple awards i can't list all of them for the lack of time but i just want to mention that uh, notably he was awarded the best district election commission office in state of punjab by the election commission of india got a silver medal from the president of india for the census 2000 uh, uh, for one census exercises Uh, and most notably he has received awards on having done a lot of it initiatives in the state of punjab uh, the president of india given a national award for best it initiatives um in uh, in elections uh, and he has uh, been in charge of a lot of m governance mobile governance initiatives and ho- hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about uh, some of them uh, on a um you know readings profile i do want to say like uh, very few officers are in the guinness book of world records uh, uh, as well and mr and mr bhagat has uh, created some uh, world records uh, by uh, initiating campaigns against like drug addiction and uh, uh, variety of other social initiatives so without further ado uh, you know mr bhagat uh, uh, welcome to isp virtually and uh, i wanted to start off by essentially asking you to give our audience a very general overview before we go into the details about you know the punjab's experience with digital governance so for someone who has no idea about what initiatives the government has taken sometimes people often think you know government is very slow in adopting digital uh, measures so what can you tell us about punjab um and its various initiatives in this in this uh, in this space thank you uh, first of all i would like to thanks isp uh, mr guru and professor aditya dhar for having me here so a uh, lot of things are happening uh, uh, because of covid people have shifted from offline offline to online so uh, punjab has also started this uh, having the structure where people can you know interact with government online and give government can give services to the people you know uh, we have around 3 crores of population which we want to serve so punjab has done various activities we know uh, there are suvidha kendras around 500 of them are in different block level district level which provide services more than 400 services are given to them and each day we are providing around 60000 people with these services which are totally online so uh, these are the front end where government interact with citizen at the block level and the district level then we have uh, total mobile based services around Uh, on m seva m seva is a mobile app uh, being done by government of punjab where online services provided you need not go to any office you just have to fill the forms and the service are services are or certificates are made at the mobile uh, uh, itself then we have government of india services which we call service plus 
these government of india uh, services are also given on punjab mobile app so m seva caters to that service plus caters to that and we also have a, a mobile based application and the online system where we, which we call it PG, pgrs which is public uh, grievance redressal system so around 800 on an average complaints we get on our mobile app and web portal and we provide services to that citizens their problems are resolved feedback is given to them feedback is taken from them and we uh, give services to that more so during covid so uh, government of punjab also did a kova app uh, which was done way ahead then what aragya situ came in so we provided all the major information to citizens the services the laboratory tests the pass system was done through the kova app and we have around 68 lakh downloads of kova app uh, uh, till date which means each household of punjab was having that application so many services like grocery services lab tests tests being conducted where the beds are available where the clinic is and how to reach to the doctor that services was very helpful to citizens providing uh, information to citizens and services to citizens so these are the various uh, mobile apps web applications which we are doing for the service of uh, punjab citizens yeah yeah so thank you for this nice uh, nice overview um one question that immediately comes to mind is one of the reasons given my limited knowledge about the state why this was able to get so much uptake for example with the adoption of the kova app is because it had an infrastructure in place uh, before covid uh, if they had to overnight build the digital infrastructure it would have been probably much more difficult um to launch such an application with you know with the onset of covid uh, with, with the onset of covid excuse me what can you tell us about uh, you know at the back end so at the front end you know doing these services for improving citizens uh, is um, obviously great at the back end what is the architecture uh, uh, not necessarily the technical details about like you know the uh, the operational but like the the data center uh, the uh, the governance society like what are those bodies um, that have that have been critical in um, getting this reform process underway in punjab so uh, in governance reform so i am having a, a two role you know to play one is the front end where we have a society we call it P- pgrs society which is punjab state e governance society which is a front end which gives you suvidha kendra with all, uh, all the uh, manpower which deals with the citizens then another part is uh, like i am also special secretary governance reforms where we have the data center looking after data center the policy formulation the acts the law which you know governs all these policies then we have uh, cdos uh, uh, chief data uh, officer chief technical officer who is having headed headed they're heading by them they are having a team of around 100 odd uh, technocrats who looks after all the uh, technology ma- mayors then we also have a, uh, a chief technical officer who is main architect of technology who links different silos data available in different silos and how it can be correlated to give you one example like a small example uh, uh, we recently launched birth certificates so birth certificates initially were uh, given by the municipal committees or municipal corporations so data was with them data was not with the health so health used to send the you know birth death data to them and then they used to issue the certificates so these were in different silos then with our chief data officer we made the silos into one one block and what we did was we authorized private hospitals to issue the certificate so as and when the child is born the certificate is given to him or her the parents basically so earlier the silos they were not talking to each other so so entrepreneur uh, architect was made so that these silos are clubbed and the data starts talking to each other the same thing we did for farming sector the because the aim was like if i am born today so the day i reach 16 so i should be hand the government should hand over my learning license to my doorstep then and there itself without me applying to that then if a person dies so there are three departments which are directly linked one is the election commission the election vote should be cut then is the pension pension should be cut immediately if a person dies 
then your ration card it should be immediately deleted so we worked on that so that this data which i am having like if a person dies and uh, he he or she goes to samshan ghat and the relative get that slip the person has died and the certificate gets generated then in there itself and this that this data flows to the different departments so this is the architect we worked on uh, and we have shared that data main aim is the citizen should not come to my you uh, know office and ask for this certificate for this data the government should proactively give the services to the citizens so this is my right if a person is born he should be given a certificate if there is death then it, the simultaneously the certificates are given so this is what we are working on as a governance reform here yeah so this is uh, all very interesting um i'm not you know some people sometimes uh may not may not be aware of the variety of initiatives the government is already taking in different uh, in different spaces uh, i do want to highlight the role of seva kendras it's an interesting hybrid model because all services cannot be done on the application uh, on the mobile application because of variety of challenges in rural india um although punjab is extremely de- developed compared to the rest of the country there are still uh, you know pockets where you know internet connectivity uh, 3g internet and so forth is a problem um so when we are talking about this hybrid model where there is some front end physical office where people can go in to uh, um to submit their application and that transition into an offline uh, uh, the, the offline application transition to an online application one of the question that i wanted to ask is some services are completely online like no government file is no government digital uh, no government physical file is even made i'm not sure if, if many people are aware of this uh, to me that was a kind of a very you know uh, uh, interesting uh, development what i wanted to understand from you was how challenging is it to shift to from this from this offline world into this online world you know there is not easy i know there you know the, the details are messy but operationally speaking can you give our audience an idea about the logistical challenges that are that that often um officers like you face in developing systems that has to take into account uh, some of these challenges in you know, working in a setting like uh, um, like punjab yeah first and foremost is the digital illiteracy the division between haves and have nots people are not very well versed with the technology and uh, uh, no doubt they are having smartphones but maximum people who are using the smartphones only use uh, for facebook and whatsapp which we cannot say they are digitally literate so we have that disadvantage of people using mobile smartphones for their services then is the training for our staff no doubt the the person who is sitting on a window who is taking the application he is dig- digitally literate he'll take your application fill the data and send it across to the departments but the person who is sitting in a department who has to deal with it so they are handicapped so what they are not we started e office now our of the file work is not more there all the departmental work has shifted to e office now it's online file but the person who is sitting on the desktop and using that he takes half an hour to deal with the file opening up using digital signatures getting the otp filling the otp and then doing the file so it's it's not easy work for them because see most of them are 30 years of service they have put in they are around 55 they'll be retiring at 58 they don't want to use a desktop so what they'll do is the the via media what we have found is we gave them uh, data entry operators so we have given it assistants to them data entry operators them so that they should not feel high, hand, handicapped and they should use the file system uh, online file system the second major challenge uh, apart from the citizens and our staff uh, is the it infrastructure so no doubt it has a cost we started uh, doing the online bidding system we have created the system where the online bidding is done people uh, do e tendering e auctions are being done but still a person who has to bid he is also you know not well versed with suppose i'm not talking about microsoft apple who are well versed they are small tenders because tenders are very small in department if we talk about departments so he is not able to fill we have to go by l1 so l1 rate comes higher than what we have procured earlier 
so this is the technical you know uh, you can call it red tapeism or handicapped or people who are not well with the it system they will not adopt that so there is a resistance we no doubt we have to do hand holding but i am very sure time will come because new the young generation which is coming now they are well versed so in 5 6 years down the line i think everybody will start using you know uh, this smart systems online systems very happily yeah this is uh, all very interesting uh, we already getting some questions uh, in the chat and, I'll, and i'm going to integrate them in the talk so i encourage uh, everybody who is listening in to please ask your questions one very important question uh, i think this is a this is a distinguishing feature of punjab the question is what these tech systems are they built in house or are they built external vendors um and this person wants to it's an anonymous question they're interested in understanding specifically about m seva but i think you can speak more generally because i think what distinguishes punjab is it's all in house you know it's not completely outsourced to some third, you know some um, big tech firm who's doing on your behalf so can you talk a little bit about the vision how did this come about how was this idea made ki is come in house karenge and you know a little bit about that as well thank you everything i think 99% of the things are in house because it is ultimately we uh, sitting in a government knows what the problem is no doubt we have a uh, uh, seminars and uh, discussions with the stakeholders the citizens who are really at the receiving end but in house development is easier for us because it's a interaction between government officers because we have around 50 departments we have to interact with them and then find out a solution uh, to give you an example m seva is totally in house because we develop the forms we uh, it's around 10 uh, lakh downloads which has been done on m seva uh, uh, we are not doing outsourcing outsourcing in generally done where the departments ask us to develop a website so website is the easiest thing so we don't do it in house we uh, give it to either nic nic do, do it for us or to a third vendor but where it is the uh, uh, form building then you have to develop a software then we do it in house because there is a bpr exercise also which we do business process reengineering because ultimately what we want we want to lower down the compliance burden of the citizen reduce the levels and then uh, develop a software so the m house uh, m seva is done here uh, coa was done by us coa came in uh, february 2020 before arogya setu or kavach was launched we did it in house we gave to 11 uh, states also the code so that they can also use during covid because we learned it from koreans uh, no uh, china what software they have used we saw them and then we built it done in house most of the things are done in house uh, in e governance society only Yeah. No doubt, One, uh, the software yeah. engineers are taken. We take it on uh, our role. We pay them, but we don't outsource uh, the whole software to anybody else. Because the major issue is generally when big companies come. I should not. I don't know whether I should say it on this platform or not. Microsoft or uh, DHL, the major companies, they don't give you code. So code is the property which is I think which should remain with the government because we have a data uh, privacy. then if it doesn't the code doesn't come then you have to reinvent after 10 years 12 years we have seen this <clears throat> tcl uh, hcl two of the big firms they came they didn't give us the code i don't know what agreement was done at that time you know 15 years back they never thought ki this will be so in thing the coding was not taken so we have to reinvent the wheel now we are not taking that chance we develop in house the code remains with us Uh, yeah this is i think uh, one very interesting uh, uh, point that you have mentioned about the benefits of doing it in house as well um you can uh, as you're saying you can outsource some uh, of the uh, some challenges outside as well uh, but the in house also is a consultative process it happens with you know with the private sector it happens with, uh, with you know with input from the ngos um and a bunch of uh, you know foundations working in this space a uh, very good um the next question that i uh, wanted to um you know talk to you about uh, was uh, you know this idea about the state data center uh, that you had mentioned there are different data sets lying with different departments they don't speak to each other um they're not interoperable or that that, that wasn't used to be the case um earlier i know there's been some uh, you know uh, progress we made on that front uh what can you tell us about the vision going forward uh, you know because part of it is in the next 5 years how do you see that thing evolving uh, and uh, what can we expect um, 
you know on that front in the coming uh, uh, in the coming few years in punjab yeah so uh, what was happening earlier we started this two two and a half years back uh, the data set the data center was not there and no security was done either it was cloud or somewhere you know data centers lying in bangalore and bombay which was being used so we established our own data set because the server the cost is less is efficient and now it's us you know our uh, officials were managing that so some problem comes up we are immediately to, uh, there to resolve that so data center has been established in under e governance society we are maintaining that it is being done in house so if i give you a small example like i am sekti mandibod also we are into in procurement there are around seven agencies which are involved in procurement so each agency is having different data sets nobody talking to each other so our aim was we started this one and a half years back when we wanted each data set to talk to each other and the data should lie with us you know in the centrally controlled data center post harvest and pre harvest there are two functions then post harvest has six agencies you have markfed you have pansa you have warehouse different agencies who procure the produce around 180 lakh metric ton of paddy and 130 lakh metric ton of wheat comes to us farmers are huge there are around 8 and and a half lakh farmers which are involved then you have around 1.5 lakh employees who are involved in uh, procurement process then you have private person you have chairmen of market committees different different so this data set was not talking to each other we were not knowing how many farmers are coming how many j farms are being issued and how many how much payment is going to be made to these farmers we don't know my mandi board not know, mandi board was not knowing what food and supply department is doing food and supply doesn't know where the storage is going to take place how much storage has taken place and they were not knowing how much produce has gone to pds the public distribution system so now we have only one set of data base the day farmer enters my mandi the gate the it is cut the auction takes place the procurement takes place it goes to the storage house and it finally goes to the pds system and to different states of india for distribution so end to end not only computerization the data feeding but also knowing which farmer has come with how many produce how much payment has been done and this produce is being sold at what no uh, 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 distributed at which state we are having all of the data if today i want to know how much income of one particular farmer is there how much land he is having because we have done land integration we have done we have done debt benefit transfer we are having all the data so data is very very informative so we can use this data for various purpose now if i want to give a fertilizer subsidy earlier because this data was not talking i was not knowing which farmer is having how much land and how much subsidy he needs to have now i give information from this data only to government of india this farmer is going to have this much subsidy on fertilizer this much subsidy on the machinery he is being he is using if i want to loan my machinery from a cooperative society this data also i am having so this data is totally uh, centrally centri- located with us so we can know everything about a farmer just a click of a button so this is what we have managed to do in one and a half years yeah uh, and i think for those of you know who are uh, who may not be very well familiar with the punjab context i you know i must say some of these initiatives have taken place in just a matter of months so the amount of uh, um, work that has happened uh, the intensity of the work that happens and how quickly the transition happens you know you'll be surprised uh, I, at least i was surprised to learn that you know one season it's all offline and then it immediately you know in the next uh, you know uh, ravi season things have completely moved across all mandis and we're talking about like 4000 mandis hundreds of market committees across all districts and these are like 8 to 10 lakh farmers right it's not a small number of people who you know whose whose details we are talking about um one anonymous question and i think we've already answered this but i wanted to maybe frame it differently the question is how has the punjab citizen adapted to this but i want to change the question slightly one worry that civil society has when you start collecting this data because it's good to identify people but then it becomes government will become the big brother you know like they will collect all this database and then they will begin to have surveillance there's always a concern about privacy and you know we know supreme court has these judgments on privacy as a fundamental right what is the thinking in the bureaucracy you know when it comes to this trade off between privacy 
uh, vis-a-vis, uh, uh, you know, um, collecting more information. Some people say privacy doesn't matter for the average person. It only matters for, you know, people like you and I in some elite circles. You know, is that, the, you know, like, given that you speak to so many farmers and, you know, a variety of different citizens uh, um, uh, regularly, is that a concern that has come up right now? Will it come up in the future? Because maybe right now it's in the you know in the infancy stage. But I want you to uh, I, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know that big uh, you know concern about the more data you collect, you know what will the government do with it? That's the that's yeah, the main yeah. that's the main. That uh, is the cause of concern. Kind of. That is the cause of concern for government of India, government of Punjab, and citizens also. So we came up with uh, around five months back. We have already uh, legislation have been done. So data privacy policy is there in Punjab. I think we are the first in the country to uh, implement that. We are very, very particular about uh, privacy of our citizens' data. No doubt, uh, people are concerned because during COVID also we saw so many, so many news. You know, when we, we started COA app and we started gathering data, health status were coming in. Then people were worried. There was news in the newspapers. What about the privacy? Privacy, we are very, very particular. We don't. Because that's why, you know, I talked about it's a centrally controlled data center. We don't allow the firewalls are there, the technical expertise that data should not go out somewhere. So uh, we came out with data uh, privacy policy. The act is there. So it's a criminal uh, offense if somebody tries to breach the uh, act. Then also, if we do any third party outsourcing, we have a non-disclosure agreement with them, which is a legal document. They cannot share this data. Data is with us. Adhar, we take Adhar because Adhar is one thing which we are very concerned. Even I am concerned if I have to give somebody my Adhar number, I am very particular because it's ultimately KYC, you know, my bank accounts, my PAN card, everything is related to uh, Adhar. So Adhar, what, what government of India has given uh, uh, concurrence is we can use Adhar data for the government purpose. Anywhere where we are giving any benefit to citizen, service to citizen, we can use that Adhar data. But it is camouflage. You will not be able to see. Only government officials will be able to see. Only to a particular extent, whatever citizen's identity I want to see. It's a one one one. It, it's not that I want to open everybody's Aadhaar number. I'll be able to see. It's not like that. If a particular person I want to see Aadhaar number, I can see. But I have to write down why I am you know, seeing that. Otherwise, it's decrypted. You will be only given services. The Aadhaar is basically the identity where we are using. If you are supposedly a pensioner or a, uh, if you are uh, having a ration card and ration goes to you. So if I want to check or a third party audit happens and they want to check whether the same person having the simil- similar Aadhaar num- same Aadhaar number has been given the service only to that extent. We are not giving any access to Aadhaar information or KYC information to anybody. During uh, to uh, in a lighter way uh, during co- uh, COVID because 68 lakh people downloaded, which means every household having a COA mobile app. So many advertisement agencies, you know, approached government. So we'll give you revenue to you share the data. We want to use the data, but uh, there was a clear uh, stand taken by government. This data is not going to go anywhere, and nobody is going to come on our platform. So we didn't do it. It was totally used for the services and benefit of the citizens. Yeah, I think that kind of stuff I'm trying to imagine. Yes, yeah, now you like imagine like your news feed and then over app people start getting ads. Uh, it would be yeah, it would be kind of disconcerting for some people. Uh, definitely, at least so this is all this is all useful to know. Um, one specific question that I have is, imagine there's a block development officer or there's a tehsildar in Punjab. What access do they have to the data? For example, you know, can I can you know can they look into like an I'm listening Mohali? Can they Google my name? Well search my name and say, okay, this person, you know, what, how much can this person really see? Do they only see some bit of my information? Do they see everything? That is something that, you know, people often are concerned about. How, how have you kind of uh, addressed that challenge? Yeah. So generally at the field level, we only give access to information of data. So they have to fill and they can only see what data they have filled. So if a block development officer who is uh, equipped with, you know, giving pensions to a citizen, so he'll be able to fill the data who is eligible with all age, his you no know, parameters, the demographic information he'll go, go to fill. And then he is only able to see whether after the eligible, whether this person was given pension or not. That's all we don't give. Editing is not possible at his level. It's the HOD level who will give, who has been given this power to 
you know, edit the <clears throat> data, if at all, and without, uh, not without giving any remarks, you know, why it is being done. <coughs> so, uh, it's only informatory and wherever he is, you know, uh, using the data for the welfare of citizens, only some BDO will be using for pensions. <clears throat> he will not be able to see the health data. It will be the CMO who will be going to see the health data. So this access of seeing the data is only limited to whatever he needs to see, not the whole of the data. Yeah, the need to know principle is seen as very important. <laughs> That's very useful. So again, I wanted the opportunity to ask the attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to put in the chat window. Um, I can even pause uh, right now and take any additional questions that I have. Uh, and I, as I wait, I'll maybe just open up to one uh, one other question, which is um, one of the main motivating factors behind digitizing the government services. What you know could be direct benefit transfers. It could be government services. Is about reducing corruption, and that's kind of uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, one of the main things that happens. I was reading a research study where, uh, in fact, they had uh, um, you know in Bangladesh actually what they had found was when some of these services were digitized and information about that was given to officers, actually corruption increased uh, because uh, people realized that they were doing efficient uh, work and they were like, if I want to do work faster, you should actually pay me more. Um, I don't know what, uh, how much of that happens in Punjab, but if you can talk a little bit, I mean, one, has the government conducted any research studies or any kind of additional work to document what is the cost saving or what is, you know, like, uh, like, is this a net benefit? I mean, do we, I mean, we're spending all this money, a lot of effort is going, I mean, we have a sense, yeah, it should be good. It is good. Uh, but uh, is it really good? I mean, do, you know, do we know that uh, sort of systematically or, you know, what can you tell us about um, that? And I, I, and I, and then we'll take over to more Q&A from the people. But I wanted to ask about corruption and the net benefit about uh, this uh, digitization work. So when I was in King's College, so my dissertation topic was M governance, the efficiency increase in efficiency. So my, my, my results was this only, no doubt it has reduced the time, output and outcomes have increased. So we have KPIs where we can monitor, earlier we were not having KPIs. So efficiency has increased, transparency has increased and accountability of an officer has increased because there are certain timelines to it and we can monitor that. Uh, to give you a small example, e-office. So uh, <clears throat> before that, uh, I think in 2009, I started when I was uh, Chief Administrator of Bhatinda Development Authority in FIFO system we started in our government. So now FIFO is everywhere, 2008 I'm talking about. We were not knowing which files you know, are coming to us, whether they are priority wise or whether a person who's bringing the file, he has some hidden, hidden agenda. You know, the, 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 he wants to get the clear, file cleared. So FIFO system was uh, uh, implemented. Now e-office also tells us which file comes you know, at what time and what how much time an officer takes to clear the time, the file. So it's a red flag if the timeline has been increased. So we have right to service act, we have right to information act, timelines are defined. So if a particular person is sitting on that file and not clearing that file, we'll get to know the higher officers, you know, he gets the red flag and he'll know and he'll ask for why the file is not being cleared. Second, uh, if I talk about my Mandi board experience, you know, being a secti Mandi board, so we started e-auction. E-auction people were not happy. Earlier it was physically auction, physical auction of the plots. So huge amount of money is involved in when you give you know land to somebody. So <clears throat> physical auction means if three people decide you know I'll give first auction, you'll give second and third, I gonna buy it. No fourth auction. So my officer will also get involved. The citizens will also get involved if they have pulled in. There's a cartel. E-auction means a person sitting anywhere. You know he can bid for that plot, bid for that shop and take it. There was a big resistance. We started four years back this in Punjab Urban Development Authority, even politically and uh, the person who were having you know, interest in that and you know our own officials, they didn't want it to do that. We started it, we gave it a press coverage. It became successful. Competition increased, money started falling, flowing in for the government. So we started the same thing in uh, Mandi board, e-auction was resisted. Till now, it's not uh, happening very, very, you know, smoothly. People are making excuses. They don't know how to use digital signatures. They don't know how to, you know, open up uh, a bidding uh, portal. But then also we are uh, successfully completed around 200 odd you know, plots. 
auctions has taken place so there are no doubt there are challenges people resist this change because ultimately if transparency comes in and accountability bids so nobody wants that so they want the information should not be you know flown to other people who takes a decision it should be with me and i should take a decision so uh, i think technology wise it bridges the gap between a common person and government i think the more we use technology the more transparency it will come in the more accountability of the officials will come in so i think we should promote more and more technology you know technological solutions to be in the uh, government sector yeah so this is uh, this is very interesting and speaks to some of, i think one anonymous question that i want to get to i think it you know it speaks to that already uh, for those of you who are not aware uh, i think during 2019 the average pendency of these applications that sir was talking about was about getting 20% which means that within the deadline about 20% of the applications would be not being done uh, but by monitoring by district magistrates uh, you know by, by by the dm office and on whatsapp groups you know this naming and shaming approach uh, the pendency is i think reduced now to i think less than 1% is you know is you know is is, is, is what the government claims uh and uh, i we can also verify that because we've been working with the you know with the department on providing them some analytical support um so uh, so yeah so, so 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 it does have real world impact uh and uh, uh, you know vinod is asking <laughs> you know can i say punjab is eradicated corruption i you know i'll still ask that question to you but i want to ask an anonymous question which is uh, how are the state society relations being reshaped by bridging the gap to digitization uh does it make the political process more powerful in terms of changing how people perceive the state as authority of influence so are we giving more power to the state uh, and is that changing the relationship between state and ngos or maybe state and civil society uh, i think that's an interesting question yeah. the person has been given the name but uh, what do you think so uh, uh, corruption is very near to my heart and uh, since you know uh, childhood days when we were studying in schools and colleges when we saw this happening we were you know uh, pissed off with the people who used to take money so i think at that time technology was not there now the technology is there and we are giving power to the citizens so that transparency and the information goes to them right to service act right to information these all are parameters where we, one can you know pitch in and ask why you are asking money for the right job see we uh, to give you an example change of land use is a money minting machine for people who are into the department who give change land, land use so we did it online we did a deemed clu wherein you need not come you just fill a form and 45 days we have to give you that clu so the upper limit is there same way direct benefit transfer to the farmers i'll i'll show you i'll give you an example how the relationship between artia farmer and a government official has changed because of one you know intervention of direct benefit to the, to the farmer generally artia is a money lender he gives money lending on 30% 40% even uh, uh, sometimes 50% higher than what bank rates are they charge interest so once they the farmer comes with the produce so money comes to the artia earlier it used to come to the artia and artia used to deduct that money so farmer will not be able to know whether it's 38% or 40% which i am paying bank rates are hardly 6% 7% but because the informal sector it's not governed anywhere artia used to exploit that secondly even my government inspectors who procure they also used to charge the farmers you know providing services per bag so this is all parallel economy be, being run because you see the scale is very high scale is 82000 crore money coming from you no know, government of india for procuring the produce 83000 crore is a huge amount if you start thinking in terms of 0.5 paisa or 0.1 paisa also it becomes huge so artia this inspector and this farmer farmer was exploited artia and inspectors used to take money so after this direct benefit transfer came in where money was directly going to the accounts of farmers farmer will not pay because he is info information has come so the data has come this much money is mine this much produce i have given to government and this much money i have come to my account now he will neither go give it to artia because the money comes to him neither he'll give to any inspector when government is going to procure whole of my produce he, the promises are being made why should i pay for anything else so farmer has been empowered by the data the dpt changes the dynamics so once the dynamics changes between you know <coughs> interrelation between official because 
official artia if they will not you know become hands in hand then they cannot siphon of money of farmer they used to do it because money was coming to artia so now this dynamic has changed same way land record integration now land record integration has taken place of farmer so the bogus billing and the produce coming from outside st state and being sold in msp it's gone now only that produce will come if i am a farmer i am uh, of uh, punjab then only i'll be able to sell my produce so that land is integrated now i will know how much money i'm going to get how much produce is there how much yield is there so artia cannot take advantage of that neither can my inspector you know agency's inspector procurement agency so this is the outside intervention which you know took place and now i think uh, we'll be able to catch hold of a person who is doing all this bogus billing or fake billing and also the farmer will not be exploited he'll be getting his due so i think uh, slowly and steadily if we keep on uh, doing more technological interventions i think we can mm, take care of the corruption issue great so i think this brings me to two more questions one is by ankit and an another anonymous person with a bunch of anonymous questions which is good um i'm going to reframe them slightly there about you know how can the state government uh, be agile reap the benefits and be inclusive and to just take one specific example and we have had this conversation before but i, but I want to make it you know i, I want the public uh, to be aware of uh, you know uh, of 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 one specific so in the example i talked about this arthia farmer uh you know dbt uh, uh thing that has happened one exclusion that has happened is the landless farmer because right now money goes to the land owner who may not necessarily be the cultivator so inclusive in one aspect great for you know uh, i mean obviously you know there's no silver bullet i understand that but there's clearly some people who are still being excluded uh, and the question basically is can you please shed light on the exclusion and inclusion impacts on citizens so maybe you can talk talk about this example or any other example that you have about you know how do we resolve that dilemma because always you know you even hear in you know government reports ki oh we have aadhar but people are in jharkhand unable to put their fingerprint nahi mil raha hai uske karan people are you know there are some deaths from you know uh, from as in from starvation How, how does a bureaucracy like deal with that challenge it's a uh, uh, one question that we wanted to ask yeah so two points one was uh, when we talked about data privacy so we wanted to use this data of facial recognition so that people who are not able to do the biometric they can be you know recognized facially we couldn't do it because the data policy didn't allow that so we couldn't catch you know the facial uh, features and have a data base for that because that was against the data policy so we didn't do it inclusion what i'll give you example like we have j forms j forms are like pan cards pan cards uh, we use it for different you know transaction kyc is linked so likewise farmers have j form whatever produce he brings to uh, his a mandi how much amount he gives which artia he has sold and which agency he has sold to that is collected in that j form so j form is being used by the farmer for getting any Uh, stamp duty uh, concessions or uh, bima yojana which is for 5 lakhs or any other purpose like income tax rebates you know uh, they get it on j forms so j form is very essential for a farmer earlier what used to happen was a j form was given by a commission agent who whom you call artia that was manually prepared so he may or may not give it he takes money for that or he gives incorrect information to the farmer because it was manually prepared it is not prepared as in when the produce comes to the mandi it will it will be prepared after 2 3 months you know when farmer will go away from a mandi and then whenever he comes and asks for it he will be given so dilly dallying takes place so what we have done we have made the online j forms we have incorporated this in digi locker because we have your aadhar number a farmer who has given aadhar and a, a mobile app a mobile number so j form is generated which is qr code based which any department either income tax or bima uh, company they can see from the q scanning of the qr code the j form they can have the access to that information once they scan the qr code so this j form as and when a farmer comes to a mandi within few minutes you know once his payment is done it is given to him online and also to his digi locker so he can use that so we have included all we have uh, around 20 lakh j farm holders right now wheat paddy and uh, we are also doing it for fruit and vegetable uh, farmers uh, who are dealing with fruit and vegetable so this is a 
big empowerment in the hands of farmers they don't have to depend upon my government official or commission agent to take that uh, you know j form secondly whenever he goes to any department you know uh, pension ration or uh, stamp duty registrar he can just show that uh, digi locker and the qr code is scanned and then they get the full, full information so it's a authentic information which is given to departments and to the farmer so this is how we are including them so they were very happy i think punjab is the only state who has done uh, digitization of uh, j forms uh, and uh, farm farmers feel happy about it there was no reaction from commission agents because they also thought it's a need or need of an r they the the commission agents also are saved of the labor you know of employing a people and cutting a j forms when farmer needs it so this is online available and it's 24 into 7 is available on their uh, smartphones great yeah i think these are all uh, very interesting uh, um initiatives that are happening um and i hope the audience is able to appreciate uh, one both the scale and the complexity and the challenges as well uh, in something like this um we're all we're actually on time we you know you know out of out of time as i understand it uh, i do want to ask uh, one question that akhil has and i guess you know has a kind of a cynical uh, you know question uh, as well i want to put both of them together akhil's overall question and probably we can end with this is you know can you uh, what is the push yeah can you basically compare punjab with other states in case you have any information about that but i think the question that i wanted to ask is is it a 5 or 10 year road map uh, that such and such things have to be digitized what is the road ahead uh, you know for punjab and i guess what akhil is also asking is how can other states learn from punjab's experience so as your concluding thoughts uh, you know what would you say about uh, you know the road map for the future uh, and uh, how can the lessons we can learn from punjab you know for other states uh, we had jharkhand orissa tamil nadu so and so forth um and in this let me add another twist which we know the saying we know the point is if the government has become so transparent efficient and inclusive why are there such high levels of farmer suicides so it's a, a negative question but i want to put both of them together you know what is the future road ahead uh, and given that it has not completely changed the picture is changing maybe it has not completely radically changed to you know we know uh, you know what he is seeing on the ground but how can you maybe reconcile the two and uh, any concluding thoughts that you have about uh, the overall theme would be very welcome thank you so so uh, there they uh, say i am also concerned because we being uh, born and brought up in punjab i am also worried about farmer suicides i have seen so many of them some were really desperate and uh, distressed farmers uh, were there their suicides are there but see political agenda and administrative agendas are totally different so administrative agendas are always building up transparency accountability we want to deliver services to people we having joined the service we the, the aim was to you know down trodden should be given that service the last man should be heard and just justice be delivered to them so whatever technological interventions we have done we want to ease you know a life of a normal common person you know if i am a common person i should be given the service this is my right i should be given that so with regard to farmer suicide so political things are totally different so what happens is we are not taking it as a uh, what i should say it's not a law and order situation the economic condition have to be seen we have to you know economically support them what happens politically is we start, start we start giving them freebies you no know, compensations 5 lakh 2 lakh 3 lakh it's not that is not going to solve our purpose we need to support that family if there is a dis- distress sale then we need to have if supposingly i am a farmer i have come to a mandi i am not being given msp then we should government should have a price stabilization fund so the gap should be given to that farmer if he is not able to sell that on msp example makai maize maize has a msp because government doesn't procure private people procure it generally the 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 price comes down so 2300 is a msp for a maize but generally when a farmer comes and there is production is high this will be around 1200 1300 you know being sold rupees being sold so the gap should be filled by government there is hardly any price stabilization fund right now we are fighting for that we have been you no know, 
uh, citing examples we should have that so that we can support the farmers once a farmer dies commits suicide giving away the loan whatever uh, loans are due to him it doesn't make sends a you know uh, healthy signal to that family 46000 crore this is a figure 46000 crore has been given as a debt relief to farmers whether this debt was basically given whether there was a distress sale whether a farmer really needed that whether somebody was asking whether they were big farmers what was their need see this was a political this thing administratively we have to see we don't give once a person a commit suicide if he comes for a distress sale then and there itself we should give that fund to him so that he can sustain his livelihood he can do a farming so my political I, like i told political and administrative agendas are totally different we see from a bureaucratic uh, you know administrative point of view they have uh, their own compulsions they have to see their vote bank how to you know uh, give funds but my my point of view is we need to have a price stabilization fund second the question was learning from other states punjab i will not say punjab has done wonders we have haryana haryana e governance society is much better they have huge funds at their disposal they 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 have uh, uh, started i think it's almost 5 6 years they have been doing different projects in e governance but what personally the best uh, state in e governance i believe is karnataka karnataka started way back in 2000 where they had huge budget and huge systems uh, uh, what we are seeing now the bhumi project we, which they started in 2002 the land record you know integration the land record uh, computerization the services they giving to farmers all integrated so i think karnataka is the best state to be followed in in governance the amount of services they are giving to their citizens i think they are par excellence they are around 1000 plus services digitally given but no doubt the citizens also digitally literate so they also citizens the demand is high punjab the demand is also not high so there is a uh, uh, from uh, our side because the demand is not high the supply is also not so high so if the i think in times to come the demand starts increasing uh, punjab will also start delivering more services but we are at e governance society we are 100% committed we started with 100 odd services now we are around 400 plus services which we are giving online i think in days to come we'll also increase and learning from other states i think we'll also deliver oh, so that's i think a good note to um, to conclude on um uh, some note of optimism although as you rightly pointed out a lot of challenges uh, remain uh, and not just in punjab across the country uh, this is not supposed to be a, a silver bullet digitization it has to Has to, it has to complement other approaches as well. I don't think anybody thinks that uh, you digitize and you do this and it's going to solve all problems. Uh, it will create new problems. Those have will also have to be solved. Um, and uh, I think uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for sharing your candid opinions. Uh, you know, I like the examples and you know, and you know, talking about the politics of it is very very important as well. Um, the bureaucracy you know how it interacts the agenda of the politicians agenda of the bureaucracy um and overall the you know the future what the next uh, few years has in store for punjab at least um so with that uh, you know i think this is a good place to stop uh, we've already gone a bit uh, over time um so I want to be cognizant of that uh, thank you once again uh for you, uh, sharing your insights and uh, we are very delighted to have you at ISP and hope to keep engaging with you in the future hey mayor thank you very much for having me here i thank isb the whole team my pleasure thank you thank you everyone um thanks everyone so that's a wrap on the business and policy dialogue hopefully to hope to see you all in the next edition uh see you bye thank you thank you, thank you.